Let's start. Resource software hour session one. Yeah, here we go. Exciting. Welcome, everybody. So, hi. So maybe we should say who who we are first and and why we do this and what we want to do today and in the series. Mm -hmm. So who starts? Yeah, maybe you go oh. it. Okay. Yeah. So I'm Richard Darst. I work at Alter University. People don't know exactly what I do. Even I don't know what I do, but I help researchers do computational science, which really sort of shows like one of the points of research software engineering. No one really knows what you are if you do it. Um, but I work on a team that maintains the high performance computing cluster. And as part of that, I'm really interested in especially teaching people and the usability of our systems and um, helping people to make better code to actually use all the resources we have. It's so nice that everybody joins us today. My name is uh, Radovan Bast. I'm calling in from Tromsø, Northern Norway. So my academic trajectory is something very similar to Richard's uh, background chemistry, but these days I work with high performance computing, uh, resource software engineering. Um, I'm looking at other people's codes. I'm looking at my old codes, writing some code, teaching programming, teaching resource software engineering tools, workflows. And this is also a little bit how this, at least the idea started. So with Richard, we we have taught a couple of workshops uh, on code refinery workshops on resource software engineering tools and and workflows. And, and we just wanted to test out streaming and recording. And we thought it would be really fun to to do this together and uh, to teach each other new tools, new tricks, and learn from each other, learn from the audience, and hopefully you can learn from us. It's the first time that we do that. So please, uh, please bear with us. But uh, you will also see that we are not uh, experts in everything. So we will all learn something new and but that's the nice thing that uh, learning never stops. There is so much to learn. Yeah, I mean, I really want to basically have an excuse to go out and see lots of new things. And then for um, you all to ask us difficult questions, we have to research and figure out. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe a bit of an outlook. So what we, what we plan to do today and also in the series, so we plan to do that every week, is that we show we look at code. Today we will look at our own code, but we encourage everybody to to submit us their code repositories, and then we can we can review them together and discuss them, and in a in a constructive way. So we will be we will be very respectful of the code. Today, to get us started, we will look at our own code that we have written, and we will uh, point out few problems, but also some aspects that are good. We will try to teach each other some new tools. We will try to show show you something. Uh, so every every session, we will try to have a, a bit of a focus. Mm -hmm. And today, the focus will be on software citation, because we, we believe that this is really of general interest. Mm -hmm. uh, almost anybody writing scripts and software will want the software to be citable. So this is what we will show you. Yeah. yeah. Really, as far as I'm concerned, we could just appear each week and take whatever questions you have, not have to do any preparations. And you see us struggle, you see us do whatever, but we get through some stuff and learn something new. That would be ideal. Yeah. And we already getting some question in through the chat and through the HackMD, which is linked just below the video. And we will later also walk you through it to explain you a bit the mechanics of how you can edit this page. But we really appreciate already the questions and comments, and we are watching them as we go. Yeah. Should we start and have a bit of a look at some of our own code and discuss that a bit to get us started? Yeah, I've got an old code we can look at. It's something that I had started making, um, what, about 10 years ago, and I stopped working on it around five years ago or so. Uh, let's see, I've got my desktop here. Um, maybe, let's see if I can paste it into the hackpad. Uh, why does it not? 
edit. Maybe I can I can try to do that while you, yeah. while you speak. Well, I've got it now. Oh, there. Okay. Yeah, so this started off as a code for community detection, which is basically some network science or graph theory kind of stuff where you look um, you look for the strongly connected groups of nodes. So Radovan, if you look at this, what would you say when you first see it? So first thing, maybe I can ask you to scroll a bit through the page all the way down. So one of the first things I would probably look at, so I see there are lots of Python, it's probably a Python project, lots of Python scripts, Python files. At the bottom, I would normally expect a readme file, so readme file is not there. Yeah, it's not there. Uh, the, the second thing I would probably, of course I would be curious and we can open up one of these files and, and have a peek. Mm -hmm. I would probably also look at, uh, if I would like to use this code myself, I would look at whether it comes with a license. Yeah, and looking through, we see there is no license, unfortunately. So, yeah, so what does this mean? So clearly I haven't expected anyone else to use this, even though I tried to make it so. So let's see, what can we look at? We notice it looks like there's Python files and let's open something. Um, uh, where's one? The community file here. So we see there's a fairly extensive doc string in here, which goes down and tries to tell you how it works, which is a good thing. Um, ideally, you wouldn't have to look in the Python file to see this, but it's there. And then a lot of other stuff. Let's see. I think we saw last week this file was about 2,500 lines, which is a little bit too long to even understand what's there. But we see it's made with classes and somewhat object-oriented, which might be a promising thing. But what is nice to see these doc strings. Also, I was I saw that there are we are importing other libraries. So I saw some mm -hmm. import NumPy and import right. something else. Mm -hmm. And um, and also maybe connecting to a comment we got through the chat. So there is also no setup.py. So there was probably never, at that time, you didn't really plan to to share the code on, uh, yeah. on the Python package index. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, this the story behind this code is that it started off, well, I started a project and I made a bunch of code and it was completely messy and I didn't know what was useful or not. But over time, I started seeing some patterns. And then I took the most useful code, put it in this other package called PCD, and then made it a little bit more stable, a little bit better documented, a little bit better tested, and then started using this in several other projects going on. So over time, over the five years of lifetime here, by the end, I was doing research. And any time I needed to do a new project, I could come to PCD and take a few functions from here to basically read in the data, do all the main analysis, and I could focus on just the new stuff. Mm -hmm. So so there the is a question through the chat, and also yeah. I have a question. So one uh, the questions in the chat is, are the doc strings compiled into an API documentation? Yeah, I so believe, I believe they are. If we look here, we see there is a doc folder. So I tried to make something here. We see it looks like it's Sphinx-based documentation. But when we look in, there is there's something that says API modules. So perhaps I did try to use um, Autodoc here. Um, mm -hmm. That's the conf pile. But I can just tell you that I tried to do this, but it was towards the end and it never really got finished and it's yeah. not really usable for much right now. Like so oh. often. I wanted to point out, yeah. so there was one thing that I, I browsed it a bit, which I really liked. And mm -hmm. if you go into support dir directory, into the support folder, mm -hmm. um, and I see what I see is a little bit late. So there is a support folder, and inside there, yeah. uh, there is a file called 
something txt and i like that because you uh it, the, i think it was the convex hull txt because mm -hmm. you have recorded you have documented where did you take the code from mm -hmm. under which license which date and i think this was a really nice practice yeah. to to not only copy paste code but also then to remember where did it come from yeah that I was really actually that, that was actually pretty clever of me i wouldn't have <laughs> thought i would have done that um, but it was really important to be able to go back and trace where things came from and um, what the values were. So the last thing I think, maybe one of the last things to point out, is these files here, all the test files. So since this was being used in different projects and I wanted to make sure it stayed working, I used uh, unit testing to test some of the main functions in here, at least the ones that were most used. So that way, whenever I would modify the code, I could really be sure that I wouldn't break something sometime later. And it's really nice to be able to take some code and then make some changes and run your test and see it fail. Because if it fails fast, then um, it doesn't fail later without you knowing about it. Um, and I had some nice strategies here. For example, in the community comparison file, I would take different implementations of the same functions, some that are faster and some that are um, more up, some that are safer, as in easier to program, and some that are more optimized. And then I would compare them between each other to make sure that the mm -hmm. my optimized versions actually did what I expected to. Yeah, that's really clever. Yeah. So it's Before like. Oh, sorry. Go yeah. ahead. It's like scientist way of testing stuff when you don't want to actually take too much time to test it. Mm -hmm. And often this is how we progress. We first find, uh, write the simple, slow code, and then we go to the more complicated, faster code. And it's nice to be there and then test the one against the other. Mm -hmm. I would like to point out one more thing, which I think now is really, I'm much more sensitive now than I used to be. Mm -hmm. So we see that the, the files are now six years old, and it's fine, five, six years old. Mm -hmm. But now imagine that we would go five years into the future or 10 years mm -hmm. into the future. Do you think that this would still run the same way it was running five years ago? And I think mm -hmm. what I'm after is a bit, uh, I was looking for like a requirements to text uh, mm -hmm. file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And maybe you can comment a bit on that. Yeah. So there is no requirement that TXT file. I can tell you right now that this code will barely even run today because it's in Python 2. So, mm -hmm. um, and there's just sort of too much for me to be able to upgrade it to Python 3. Well, not really too much. I could do it as I need it, but in practice, I don't need it that much. So it's probably going to just, well, stay here as it is. Um, but yeah, there were cases, for example, I used a library called NetworkX and it upgraded to version two. And then I had to make some changes in order to have it stay working. Oh. Um, and that's not documented. And if someone tried to use it without knowing that, then they'd get these random errors that, well, they could just not figure yeah. out unless they were already an expert. And the take home message here is that uh, it's really important to somewhere document the dependencies and their versions. And of course, this is Python specific. So for Python, it would be either requirements or text or dependf, or it would be a, a Conda environment file. But in any language, there, there is a mechanism to record the dependencies. And, and you will be grateful that you did that when you look at the code again in five or 10 years. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's important for scientific reproducibility. Yeah, I can see that we have a couple of interesting questions on the chat. Maybe we'll come back to them later. We we have a room for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. We can also take them now. I don't know what you think, Richard, or we we have a look at another code first. Yeah, I think you had a nicer code to share. Would you like to look at that now? Yes, I will. I will show one code example, but. Also, for full disclosure, I have many, many code projects which are not so nice. And uh, what we will do next week is next week, we will, next week we will switch roles and I will show something which is less than ideal and which will show something nice. So I will take you now to, to GitHub. Yeah, in fact, this is one of the things I like to emphasize a lot. So you shouldn't try to make stuff perfect. You should always try to make it a little bit better over time because you never know what's worth investing all the time in. 
And two is software two. will anyway will never never be perfect. It's never finished. It's not a static thing. So I will take you to a project which is called NumGrid, and what it does it. So here's the title: numerical integration grid for molecules. But the few things that I wanted to point out, which I do these days, and I and it's also something I learned over time, is okay. There is the project, but also there is a one two line summary of what the code actually does the purpose of the code and this is something i didn't used to do because when you work with your project for weeks and weeks every day several hours you know precisely what it does but often this is something forgotten that we not communicate in very briefly what is this code actually good for a couple of nice things here it's a very small code in fact it's a code written around another code uh, but a couple of nice things. The code has a digital object identifier, and we will come back to that later. So the code can be cited, and in fact, the code is somewhere archived. It is There is a Python package index package. There is a license. And if I want to know what I'm allowed to do or not allowed to do, I can consult here top right. So here are my permissions and limitations and uh, conditions of use. Do you know if you've gotten any citations of the software yet? Let's have a look. So I will follow this. Uh, I will follow this digital object identifier badge, which will take me to a service called Zenodo, and we will revisit that later. Mm. So later I will show you how we can create such a deposit for a project where I haven't done that. And here, it's not a massively used library, but still. So a couple of people looked at it. There are a couple of downloads. I know for a fact that it's used in a couple of codes which uh, don't cite it yet, but will. Mm -hmm. okay. So there is a way to find your, to also measure measure the impact of the code. Yeah. The code has uh, automated testing, and maybe at some other session we can have a focus on automated testing and uh, and code coverage. The, the two more things that I wanted to point out here is, okay, there is a documentation in form of readme. It's relatively lightweight, so all the whole documentation fits in here. But the two things that I'm now very sensitive about is it has a example, a copy-pastable example. So somebody could copy this, paste it into the terminal, and try it out, and, and it would run. And I think this is really important to have a good starting point. And then mm. users can adjust it. Yeah. Or we should not require from uh, from colleagues and users to read through pages and pages of documentation and piece together a good starting point. Another thing that is now really important to me, and I haven't done that for many codes, is to make it citable. Mm -hmm. So we have seen there is a, yeah. a digital object identifier, and I also recommend here the recommended citation. Yeah, I, I find that pretty important. Now, that probably would have bumped my citation count some, I guess. Yes. And for for some codes, I haven't done that, and I know that they have been used, and it's difficult for me to document the impact of the code. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. So you've got the readme file. What's the code written in? So the code is uh, it's mainly C++ with some C underneath and Python around it. So you can call it out of Python or out of Fortran, or out of C++, but the core of it is C++. OK. And it has some automated tests. Yeah. And we use this service here. And I can see that the latest build is erring. Common, <laughs> but what I know what know? it is. It's, uh, it, it happens oh. to work on Linux, and it there is some problem on, on the Mac. Yeah, so what's this thing we see here? So uh, the green and red lines here. So these are test builders. They are somewhere in the cloud. Every time I make a change to the code, these test runners start running. And after a couple of minutes, they report back. And we test here on, on, on different environments and different operating systems. Yeah. And there is apparently some issue that I should look into. OK. Yeah, it's quite nice to be able to just push your code and then see if it, well, get notified if something goes wrong and not have to uh, figure it out yourself. So, yeah. So anything else uh, you like about this code? How long did it take you to make it like 
this here. So the code has grown over really over years, but on and off. Mm -hmm. So how would I know? I would have a look at insights and mm -hmm. contributors. And okay. then I can see that it I started this in 2015 and mm -hmm. and on and off working on it. Yeah. And you've got some other contributors there, yes. so that's pretty nice. Right. Should we take some questions? Because we got a couple of interesting questions. Yeah, or... we've got some stuff in the chat we can look at. Let's take a look. Or maybe we can also explain the, the HackMD, mm. but also then I'll take the questions. Yeah. Do you want to show the HackMD on your desktop? Um, yes, yes. OK. Or I can too. I have it open here, actually. So. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, if you can do it, I should just note the URL. Yeah. So down below under the Twitch stream, there's a link to a HackMD pad, which you see here. The link in the um, in the description looks nicer. But this is basically markdown text on the left and the rendered stuff on a, the right. So we can come here and then write some stuff and it appears live. Uh, yeah, we see it appears live. Um, so we like it because it's open source and works pretty well for just text-based stuff. So, uh, Maybe yeah. we can say that uh, if you indent the dash a bit, then it looks like an answer. So we can have, we can simulate threads here. Yeah. And we encourage everybody to ask questions, but also to answer questions. So, and we will, because it's a little bit difficult to handle all these different keyboards and the screens. But <laughs> yeah. some of the some of the questions we will also answer then after the after the recording, and and also all the all the websites that we will visit, and we will visit a couple of them. Mm -hmm. We will then post into the into the HackMD. Yeah. So, um, in fact, this red answer here was answered by someone else. So I guess this first question, do Zenodo version DOIs when the releases happen? So, or does Zenodo update DOIs when releases happen? So yes, so one DOI always refers to the same thing, but these days there is a master DOI and then V1, V2, V3, V3 whatever. So you can link to the DOI of the exact code you used in the paper but then from there, you can also find the latest version of the code and all of the released versions. And we so, will make a little demo later where we show how to how to create a Zenodo record. Yeah. There was a question about licenses, which um, which I guess takes more time than we can take right now. But we can uh, dedicate some more time in a future session to talk yeah, about it. We should have a session on that. I think an important topic. Mm -hmm. How do you decide between CFFI, Python, PyBind 11 to generate Python bindings? So the question is about how to uh, how to couple Python to something else. And I like to use PyBind 11 when when I couple Python directly with C++. It requires C++ 11, but it, it is a modern modern tool. Cython is very powerful, but I think complex. I personally don't use it because it's uh, the layer is not very thin, but it, it is extremely powerful. So I personally go, uh, go between PyBind 11 for C++ and I use CFFI, so the C foreign function interface, when I need to interface to C code and also Fortran code. So what I like to do is Fortran, a thin C layer on top, CFFI and Python. Yeah, I'd be interested to hear more about this later. I've used Cython before some, and it's nice, but by the time I started using Python heavily, I didn't have that much low-level code to interface with, so yeah. Has anyone okay. used Python? I haven't. I don't know it. Yeah. Uh, so this is new to me. We should also have a quick look at the chat. There were also some questions. I, I tried to copy the chat questions to the oh, hackpad. Okay. Um, Great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there was. Doing, um, yeah, we can also. Uh, please go ahead. 
Yeah, there was a comment in the chat about running two to three on my old Python code to make it work on Python 3. Mm -hmm. I thought about that, but at the time I needed it to still work on Python 2 and I didn't want to have to maintain the automatic conversion. So I just said, I'll wait until the problem solves itself later. And well, it solved itself by not using it anymore. So, <laughs> yeah. Also, we have a question to the audience. So a question that actually Richard asked me many times, and I really like the question. And the question is, uh, what do you know now that you wish somebody had ta taught you earlier? So what is it that you know now and use now, and you wish somebody had shown you that a couple of years back? I think it's a great question. Yeah. So maybe we can accumulate some answers and maybe we can ask each other the question. So, uh, so how about you, Richard? What is it that you know now that you wish somebody had shown you, hmm. told you? That's a hard question and really, I'd say almost everything. I've asked this so many times, so I might be a bit biased. I've heard some good answers from other people, but I think my own answer would be how to package and distribute code. So basically you see the PCD I showed you, it was a bunch of Python files in a Git repository with no packaging. So it couldn't be distributed on pip and it couldn't be installed and versioned very well or anything. So being able to um, package up and distribute these things really is one of the first things you need to do to form a community and to make some code last well. So I'd say that. Mm -hmm. And what about you? So I would like to cite a quote that I like a lot. And it's by Enrico Leran. And that is uh, that the two, your two main collaborators will be your future self and your past self. And I think I really know it now. I understand it now and feel it now. And it was not clear to me. Because many things I have started, I thought they were just for me. Mm -hmm. And this quote is really great. Your two col main collaborators will be your future self and your past self. And we should say that also to everybody who says, you know, version control, git, GitHub. I don't need that because it's just me. I don't need documentation because I will remember. And well, I thought the same thing. I thought I would remember why, what I did and why I did something, but well, I didn't. Yeah. So, so I, I should have been nicer to myself and yeah i've seen many people do something submit a paper and then they get uh reviewer comments back and then they can't run their code to reproduce their even the same figures they had before and then that's one mm -hmm. of the worst feelings in the world so yeah <laughs> yeah okay mm -hmm. should we yeah so show something or shall we uh, i see that we are now getting answers to that question that is great and we yeah. can come back to that later so yeah so listen as a chance to yeah i propose uh would you like to talk to show as zenodo and how you post something there and we can have people Sounds keep good. answering this question and then we'll see what um what comes next that sounds great. Okay. So we will now take something like 10 minutes. I will show you how you can, with, with the Zenodo service, get a digital object identifier for your code. Mm -hmm. I will show that for a code that is on GitHub, but I will also comment that how it doesn't have to be on GitHub to get to deposit it in Zenodo. I think the first page I would like you to take, to take you to, and we will post the link later, is if you search for FAIR Software Netherlands. Fair Software Netherlands. Uh, this is a beautiful page about software fairness. So to make software findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. Yeah. And this website gives beautiful, really nice short recommendations on on what what we all should do. Uh, take a look at this website. So number one, use a publicly accessible repository version control. License. We talked about it a bit. We should have our we should have a dedicated session on licenses. Registry, community registry, somewhere where we deposit the code where we can share it. And I would like to now focus on on the software citation. How can we enable citation for the software? If I scroll down a bit, 
and maybe a bit tiny. Can you make font. it a bit larger? Yeah. Thanks. So this gives hints here on there. It mentions code meta citation file format. I will come back to that. There are a couple of services where we can deposit code and get this persistent identifier. And this is not even an exhaustive list. So I will show you the model, but it's not the only one. Also, your your university, your organization may have their own uh, archive where you can receive digital object identifiers. Mm -hmm. And I will do that for a code where I should have done it a long time ago. So I will do it live here at the UI for a code where I should have done that. This code is called smashing. Okay. It's a, it's a Python code underneath some C++. Mm -hmm. What Wasp. you see here is, uh, so this code generates massive meshes, so these triangular meshes. And what you see here, what looks a bit like a skeleton is in fact, uh, the northern Norwegian coast. So these these green triangles are in the water, mm. and these white areas is the mainland and the islands. Yeah. Looks and this pretty. Is the, and this is the island that uh, I'm now right now talking to you from. Mm -hmm. And this code is used to generate these meshes, and on these meshes, uh, researchers run simulations on oceanography and what fishes eat and how they get eaten. Mm -hmm. uh, this code. Is, uh, yes. is, the, is this the thing that sped up, what, a million times or a thousand times or something when you rewrote it? This was uh, step one, step one, but actually uh, now another rewrite of the code is in progress. So I'm already uh, working on the, on the follow-up. So I'm rewriting this thing to Rust, mm. but it is, that is a bit out, out of the scope. Okay. And this is also one of the reasons why, okay, so it has a license and it has testing, but it doesn't have a, it's not really citable because at the time, I thought, well, I will first finish it up, and then I will get the citation. But guess what happened? Uh, I then other things happened, so I never never got that. But I know that this code is useful, and it is used. And this is maybe not a full measure, but I know the researchers are using code, so it sh it will be good for me to get citable. Now, how do I do that? I will go on zenodo.org. Zenodo.org. Yeah. So you're using Zenodo and not the sandbox for testing here, right? I think I will be courageous and I will get the real DOI right away. But I encourage, uh, I encourage the uh, the listeners. If you are new to Zenodo, there is also sandbox.zenodo.org where you can practice first. And this this can be useful because when you when I create this record on the real page, which I will do now, the record is forever. It cannot easily be, easily be removed, and that is the that is the whole purpose of a digital object identifier. But for practicing, I recommend to go to the sandbox where what you create is not forever. You can practice as soon as you have it debugged. You can go to the real service. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me that uh, one thing I wanted to mention that one motivation to do that is to get citable, but the other motivation is to be findable and accessible in future. Mm -hmm. This code is used. It's used in research. It's used in publications. But putting it on GitHub is nice, but it's not enough because nothing prevents me from deleting it. I could, I could delete this repository and then it's gone. But how do I make sure that the code can still be found five years later? And this is another motivation why I will deposit it here because here it will then stay approximately for forever, at least for many years to come, even if I delete my uh, GitHub uh, repository or an account. So I'm now right. on the org. I will log in. Uh, I could choose Orchid or GitHub. I will log in with my GitHub account. And now I'm logged in. I will go to this GitHub overview. It's loading. Here we go. And Zenodo shows me what to do. All I need to do is flip the switch, switch, create a release, get a badge, and I will show you these steps. So below here are a couple of projects which already have a DOI, and then many projects, many of them test projects, which don't. I will now find the one which I want to make citable, and it is called smashing in this case. And here, all I need to do 
first I need to flip the switch to on, and from this moment on, Zenodo will wait until I make the next release and then create this DOI. And in fact, I, I learned yesterday that there is a very convenient way to cre create that release. I will go back to this project. When I click on that, all I need to do, and this is new, I need to go on this button and it will take me directly to the release page on GitHub. I follow that. And here, a little form where I can fill out the version number and it happens to be zero to zero. Mm -hmm. I can give it a longer title. I can give it a description. Yeah. So I have heard that the GitHub releases are basically tags. So I guess these are annotated tags and the first line is the first line of the tag message and the rest is the, well, rest of the tag message. That, that is right. So for Git, uh, from the Git perspective, these are tags. So you, I could, you could also equally well create the, the, the tag in the command line, push the tag to GitHub, mm -hmm. which would then also automatically create a DOI uh, for a repository that is already linked with the mm -hmm. So you can basically create the tag from the command line, push it to GitHub, and then Zenodo will get notified, yes. download the latest copy, make a new DOI for you for that version. Yes. Nice. And I will publish the release. And did I click correctly? Yes, now we go. The release is published. When I now revisit Zenodo.org, Uh, back to my GitHub overview. Mm -hmm. Okay. And back to now a new project is showing up here. That's the new project. And we can see it already got a DOI. Okay, nice. Yeah. And I could now take this badge, put it in my readme, and then people will know where to find it here. Mm -hmm. I think I would like to give a few more comments on Zenodo and where you can go from here if we have the time. How is our time? I time think looking? we're doing pretty good on time. Uh, let me check the chat schedule really quick. Yeah, I think we're doing good. So just maybe two more minutes on a few hints where you can go from here. So this code is citable. One question that you might have is, well, what if my code is not on GitHub? What if it's on GitLab? Or what if it's mm -hmm. on your university mm -hmm. GitLab? Uh, Zenodo has a nice integration with GitHub, but you are not restricted to GitHub. You can also upload here directly uh, a zip file or a mm. tarball and so, deposit your data, code, whatever. Yeah, so in this case, you'd have to upload it yourself, but everything else is basically the same. Yes. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I want to mention is that each record, each data or software deposit has, a, uh, has metadata. Mm -hmm authors, title, license, and Zenodo will will infer this information from the GitHub repository, from the contributors, from mm -hmm. the title, uh, and it might not be what you want. I see. So what I wanted to say is that if you have lots of authors and if you do regular, regular releases, you can modify this metadata on Zenodo, but uh, what, you, what you might be interested in is uh, you can, I will show you one example where we do that. Uh, you might be interested in a file like, I think I did that here for this one. There is a dot, dot zenodo dot json where you can, you can put this data in. Who are the authors, who are the contributors, what is the title, and zenodo will use this. Also coming back to this fair, software page there are these really nice tools citation file format and there you can read up more so this is an additional file where you can put metadata into your code to make it cross citable findable by machines and there are also tools where you can convert this to these and other json so these are some hints on where to go from there so why would we use zenodo what's its key Feature, like who funds the Nodo? So behind that is Open Air and CERN. So it's a non-profit 
and why would we recommend it is that it's well it's non-profit and it is basically guaranteed to run for the lifetime of CERN so we have we have really uh, a long-term uh, we can be sure that this is persistent at least for the for the next 20 years mm -hmm. yep. yeah so maybe this is i think all i wanted to show about zenodo we will uh, at the end return to questions yeah so do you have anything else interesting we can talk about to fill a few more minutes so we have we thought that one thing we could do is in every session we show each other something new mm -hmm. so now um, i was curious about your git pr mm. you could have a look yeah uh, there's also something uh, a command i wanted to show you if we have the time mm -hmm. but maybe maybe you could show it because now i was talking all the time yeah so yeah i've been meaning to show rather than this little command for a while now so We'll probably talk about this later, but everyone wants to use Git pull requests to do code development for reasons which, well, if you've been to a code refinery workshop, Radovan's probably told you. But anyway, the thing is it took too many keystrokes for me. So I wanted a way to do them faster. So yeah, I don't have time to really go into what a pull request is, uh, but maybe we'll try to make it and then see well, see the effect, and then we can go into it more later. So let's see, back to my desktop. Let me find my terminal here. So I need to make a pull request. What do I need to do? Um, how about we go to the uh, get, so go to our web page here. Oh, there's mm -hmm. an uncommitted file. Ah, I need to delete this here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got a change here that I forgot to commit. Actually, it's a longer story. I moved the file and I didn't tell Git that it was deleted. Anyway, let's do it now. So I want to make a pull request. So I use Git PR new, and what should we call this? So remove. So basically, there's this extra readme file that got turned into a page on the Research Software Hour web website. So I tried to remove it right before our stream started, but well, clearly I failed because I didn't run git status. So I do git pr new remove extra readme. So I type and this. So, and the git pr, that's, so this is a script, a tool that you have written? Yes, yeah. So I wrote git pr, it sort of started slowly. Um, automating just one thing and now it automates a little bit more. So I run git pr new and give it a name. Now I made a new branch which is called rkdarst slash remove extra readme. So now if I do my git status then I see there's this here so I'll tell git to remove it. Git remove the file Git status, okay, it's actually staged now. Git commit. Uh, so I'll give a line that says what I do and now I'll explain why. Dot bar, okay. So I save it and now I get status. Okay, it looks good. So now I'll do git pr push dash r. So the dash r says open a pull request as I'm pushing it. So I run this. This will, this will open the form or will it? How, I'm curious. How, yeah, let's so it pushed it and now it uses a command line program by GitHub called hub which does actually all the really hard work here. So it uses the GitHub API to say, please open a pull request from this branch to um, the repository. So I, well here it presents me with the same commit message that was in my, the one commit I made. I do, well, I save it 
and then I wait, and now the pull request has been made. So mm -hmm. let's open this up and see what it actually has in it. And what do you know? There it is. So it required basically um, nothing, no extra keystrokes, sort of the bare minimum to say start it and push it. I see in the command line someone says, I'm not using Vim. Actually, I am using VI. Uh, look at this, VI. Oh. Okay, now I see it. So that's my VI for you. I had a friend that once wanted to learn how to use Emacs to make fun of it better. Let's just say he uses Emacs now. Okay, so, well, anyway, back to the point. So the pull request is open. If we look at the pull request, we see there is a conversation. It shows the commit I made and will show you what files have been changed. So it says this file has been deleted. So now Radovan can come, look at the commit, make sure it makes sense, and then he'll push something that says merge pull request and it's there. So that way, even though we're two people working on the same project, we can always be synchronized and on the same page about what we're doing. So, so to, can, can I accept the pull request also from the command line? So not with git PR. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can always fetch the branches and then uh, merge it and then push it. But mm -hmm. I haven't seen that. Uh, I haven't had a need for that yet, but it would be easy to add. Yeah, really neat. Hmm. OK. Um, yeah, and it's available on GitHub, obviously. Under... Yes, and on the Nordic, Nordic HPC group. And I yeah. forgot to mention that, that this is one of the things that we are collaborating on. So Nordic High Performance Computing yeah. Group, where we collect scripts that and, and tools uh, of general mm -hmm. interest. Yeah. And that's basically the bare minimum. Readme file, license file, and one single shell script to put in somewhere. And, well, it works on GitHub and GitLab now. Hmm. So I will... Hmm paste this into the hack pad and let's see what's next. So yeah, and I had heard you had this tool called TLDR that helped make it easier to read man pages or something. Would yes. you like to tell us about that? Absolutely. Okay. So it, and I thought it would be a nice tool for the first session because I think it's general, mm -hmm. general purpose, general interest. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will take over the screen. Yeah, there you go. Also here, uh, somebody mentioned in hackpad osf.io. So that's another, I forgot to mention that. So that's another place where we can deposit uh, software and data sets. But now back to my, back to, uh, let's go to the terminal. So the tool that I wanted to show you is uh, TLDR. Too long, didn't read. And it's a nice alternative to man pages, manual pages. Man pages are the traditional way of seeing how a command can be used. And one example, one thing that I, I could not remember for years and years was when creating creating a sim link, a symbolic link. I couldn't remember is the is the target first and then the link name, or is it the other way around? And one way to find out is to ask the traditional man man pages, man ln. Is this, is this large enough readable? Should I maybe zoom in a bit? Maybe a little bit. I guess it can't hurt with what you're doing now. Yeah. So I can consult the man pages. And there is a lot of description and all these options and flags and are explained. Very often I find these a bit overwhelming. What I'm often looking for is an example to get started. An example, like an everyday example. I'm often missing these here. I find these man pages very useful when I already know the command or when, when I see a, an option and I'm unsure what this option does, then I consult the man pages. But a nice alternative is TLDR. You can install it with your package manager, apt, pacman, rpm, also with pip and, hmm. and really many, many other tools. Let's, let's search for it. TLDR GitHub. It is on GitHub. It is it is community driven. 
So these are help pages that you can improve yourself. And they exist for many, many tools and many, many languages, many clients. So you can install it using your favorite client. But I also wanted to show you how it really looks. So in, I could do T, TLDR LN. And it will not, it will really show me the, only the everyday examples. And here I see everyday examples that I can use. Aha, uh -huh, this is how it worked. First, the path that I want to link to, then the symlink. Another example, if you are wondering, how was it again that I can transfer files from machine A to machine B? There was this secure copy, TLDR, secure copy. How did that work again? Here, here I have some, some examples. So I use this tool really almost every day. Highly recommend. Yeah, seems like something we should install on our cluster here at Alto because, well, why not? So when you install it, does it come with the data or does the data need to be updated some other way? Good question. Uh, I think it fetches the data. Mm. So I, don't, I don't know the answer. Yeah. I, th I have a feeling that it uh, needs an internet connection. So I think it f fetches the data over the, uh, directly mm -hmm. from GitHub. Yeah. Um, I think you can also fetch the data without even installing the tool. So I think this is okay. what it's doing. I'm, I'm, I'm unsure. Yeah. Okay. Well, good to hear about. So with that so being we have said. Seven minutes left. Maybe. Yeah, we, take questions? yeah we can look at some of the other questions and see what comes. Um, does anyone have a really hard question to try to stump us that we might need to come back next time to talk about? Um, so remember to please use the hackpad for these questions so we can, we don't have to look at this, scroll back and um, manage all these things. And also a reminder for like next time, we would really appreciate code examples that we can discuss and we will do that very constructively. Yeah, like if there's one person that has some code they've made or um, one of their collaborators made, actually it should be a code that you made, then if you can give it to us, we can give some tips and feedback on it. So we got some answers to the question, what do you know now that you wish somebody had taught you? How to use Git properly? Branching, merging, rebasing, amending. I think it is the time to learn Git properly is I think a time well spent. Of mm -hmm. course it's a time investment, but it will, I think it will come with, with a huge return. Uh, any any version control beyond uh, saving files with different names. How to organize a project, because often projects start with as a small single script, but then they grow and grow. So how to mm. how to organize projects into functions and modules and packages, and how mm -hmm. to separate things. How to organize a data analysis pipeline. Yeah, very good points here. Yeah, uh, Python debugger. And yeah. Jupiter, so debug magic, magic. Yeah, the debug magic would be a nice thing to show. Um, hmm. Yeah, maybe if we uh, we have time, we can try to live demo one of these after the official time is over. Um, I guess I have, an, I have another question for you all. So, does um. Do you think that these kind of skills are valuable? Um, like, do you think they're really valued? So back when I started in my research stuff, I thought that many people didn't really see value in doing these things. So I spent time learning them and that let me get ahead in some ways, but also, well, I fell behind in some other ways. So do you think this culture is changing? That would be very interesting, interesting to know. Mm -hmm. I have I, I have the same ex, same observation, same experience, same feeling. Yeah. There's a good question here, question on a pull request. 
I've worked with Git, but I've never worked with pull request. What things change in terms of workflow when working with PRs instead of pushing directly to the main branch? Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to try to answer that or should I give it a try? Um, yeah, we can try both. Yeah. I mean, go ahead and I guess. Maybe, uh... Yeah. So um, immediately nothing has to change. So I first started by doing um, only the big major changes that I needed someone else to review. So I would, um, let's see, what's it? I, most things I would push straight to master, but then if I did something I really wanted someone else to look at, I'd make the pull request, send it, ask someone to look, we'd talk about it and then merge it, which was kind of nice. Um, to me, the biggest change is that after you make one given change, it won't become live until it gets merged into master. So you may not be able to use it when you're making some other change right away. So it works best when your changes are sort of loosely connected somehow. Um, second is you need people to actually review them. So um, yeah, and if there's no one to review them, then well, sort of what's the point? Although there is sort of a point because they'll get notified, emailed, and then you merge yourself and at least people had a chance to comment on it. I'll show you one little thing I do use with PRs while Radovan talks, actually. Um, so you want to show something and I, I will comment now also on yeah. this question? Or? Yeah, okay. go, go ahead and comment and then I'll come back and show something yes. new. So, uh, so one step towards pull requests is to make the the master branch the main branch read only so nobody can push to it directly and it feels really limiting and it feels like it's delaying your work but i i think i recommend it for projects which are where you have more than one person mm -hmm. and uh, and i like to emphasize that it's not only about the code quality but it's really about the learning from each other so i, I learn a lot from others commenting on my changes and and also, I learn a lot from looking at the changes submitted by others. A lot about programming and about practices. Yeah. And, and I like to compare it with publishing and peer review. Also, peer review slows down publishing of papers, but I think for good reasons. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that we have to stop working. It just means that we then, this thing is waiting and we work on the next thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. I've tried to get my teams here to use pull requests more. And partly it's because I want us to work together more. So by having this review, then we know what we're doing and we can actually like let the technology guide our collaborations more, which exactly. I think is quite valuable. And you have you have at least at least two people know about something instead of one person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I wanted to show here, okay, let's see. This is my GitHub page. Up here, there's a pull requests um, bar. You have to be logged in in order to see this, but this shows pull request. So right now it shows pull request I'm the author of, but I'm going to erase this and then get it from all of these organizations I'm currently most involved in right now. Um, yeah. So here now I see all the active pull requests in these organizations. So I basically always have this open in a browser tab right now. And each night before I go to sleep, I scroll through it and see what needs to be reviewed and then try to give some comments quickly on it in order to keep the development flow going. And I think it's something that, well, can really help to keep the speed of these reviews going up. It's always nice when you don't know what else to do. You look here and you start to do something. It's really nice because it, I, uh, otherwise it would be easy to lose track of all the different mm -hmm. uh, tasks that wait for you. Yeah. So I see that we have now we are now one hour in, mm -hmm. uh, but we we get very interesting questions. So we thought that we would soon now close the official program, but we would stick around for a little bit longer and answer these questions. Yeah. And maybe uh, Richard, we have some some words here before we close the official resource software hour. 
not really. So I saw that our stream peaked at around 35 people. So I'd like to thank everyone for watching. Um, maybe now if you could give some feedback. So what worked well here and what should we do for next time? And most importantly, how can we uh, promote this to people who are who people who most need it, who think that they don't need software right now? Mm -hmm. oh, someone on chat just said, give the stream a title. OK, so I need someone that knows Twitch a little bit better to help with this one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can I change the title live? Oh, here well, we go. We try it later on. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Yep. Mm. So thanks, everybody, for, for listening and for great questions and input. And I'll, we will stay here a bit longer, and I'll, we will comment a bit on these. So the questions that we didn't have time to comment on yet yeah if you want to take a short break and then come back like 60 second break or should we just go let's just go okay. yeah let's go. so uh, i wanted to so there was a question about regarding tldr mm -hmm. so there are bro pages i didn't know about that there's cheat that i remember yes uh, then another question, how comprehensive is the coverage of TLDR? It is pretty comprehensive. I, I have seen very few commands which were not documented. Nice thing is that you can contribute documentation, which you can also do to traditional man pages, but maybe less obviously. So if, you, if there is something that is not on TLDR, you can send a pull request to them and add it to their uh, archive. Follow up on pull requests, and that is a very good question because I think I wasn't very clear about that. You mentioned working only on the main branch versus working on several branches. How does it work? How do, how do I keep in mind what information is stored in which version of the project? It sounds complex. And one answer was I like to organize branches with names. So to give branches a meaningful name, I like to, if this is a project with many people, I like to also prefix the branch with, with my name so that I can find my own branches and also that other people know who to talk to if they see this branch laying around. But the model would be that when you are on your own, uh, it's completely fine to work on one branch and it can be the main branch. But what I find useful for bigger projects with three, four people within the research group is to define the main branch, which is typically the master branch as read only. And we don't make any changes to that branch, but oh, for every single change, we create a new side branch, one branch for one thing only, and everything goes through code review uh, via these pull requests. So this is the model. Anything I forgot there? Follow up as well. Do you give grad students, collaborators direct access or ask to fork projects? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. And I have an answer, but maybe I'm talking too much. Uh, I don't know if you... Yeah. I can I can comment there that I think it's great if if in a project there is nobody it's more equal than others. Of course, there will be the persons who know more and who are the maintainers and who have been there for for decades. But I see nothing wrong with a junior researcher, a master student reviewing code of a, a senior person. Sometimes the the senior professors are not the developers with the latest programming practices. So they will also appreciate input from, from, from the young folks. So it doesn't always have to be a senior person reviewing a junior person. Mm -hmm. But uh, often for those who people you don't know, external collaborators, they will then work via forks. So mm -hmm. they make a copy. Yeah. I've basically never regretted being more open at the start because the easier it is for someone to contribute, the more likely they will or they're more likely they'll stay around. There was a good comment in the chat, best way to learn how to do PRs, start contributing to an open source project. Um, yeah, so I would really like to say this is a good idea here. Um, and also follow some open source projects. So let's say there's something you use a lot that is active on GitHub, go there and uh, click the watch thing on GitHub and you'll start getting notified about all the changes they do. And just seeing how these experts, well, 
experts, maybe they're just like you, they're still learning. But seeing how people work together on a real project will teach you a lot about how you do your things. And in fact, that's how I've sort of learned a lot of the things that we've been talking about here, just watching other people, seeing the best stuff, and then um, adapting it myself. Yeah, it's a great way to learn also opening up a program written by somebody else, the code, and looking how did they write it mm -hmm. and trying to make sense of it. Mm -hmm. And some things will be very unfamiliar. But uh, yeah. From, yeah, lo lo if you want to know learn how to write, uh, well, we have to read. And, and uh, contributing to an open source project, you can start with like fixing typos. So when I mm -hmm. go through documentation, I find a typo. I send in a pull request and it's an easy one and they appreciate and then I also feel good about it. So there is a, there's a small, tiny contribution to a tool I like. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Yeah, and we'll go and try to answer more of these questions in the uh, Twitch or in the Hackpad after we're done make sure everything has a minimum answer and then go link it from our website. And we will, so we'll be back in a week. We will try every week to, to focus on a particular topic. And today we got a lot of inspiration, many things that we postponed to, to later. So there's a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope we, we will grow this and people like it and we would really appreciate a feedback so one thing that you enjoyed and one thing we can we should improve it's our first time we are learning here as well yeah should we close the session or what do you think richard yeah i guess it seems like we're running out of questions so thank you all for watching um Hopefully see you next week. Yeah, thanks so much. Looking forward. And yeah. thanks, Richard. With your friends, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thanks, uh, other friends. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye, everybody.